Today, Hard Talk is on the road in Moldova, a long neglected corner of Europe, which is now caught up in a trial of strength between Russia and the EU. Until 1990, the people here were citizens of the Soviet Union. Now, their government dreams of joining the European Union. So, just like in neighboring Ukraine, all the ingredients are here for a strategic standoff which could turn ugly. A summer's morning in Chisinau, Moldova. Thousands gathered outside Parliament to embrace a European dream. This former Soviet Republic, like its neighbor Ukraine, has signed a partnership deal with the EU. The air was heavy with European symbolism, but Moldova was, and still is, Russia's backyard. And just as in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin will do all in his power to keep it that way. Moldova is the poorest country in Europe. It's still dominated by agriculture. The soil is fertile, but this is a land of small farms, hard labor, and low returns. We found this Soviet-era combine harvester rumbling through a field of barley. The harvest crew working dawn to dusk for just a few euros a day. Grapes have long been Moldova's most valuable asset. These vineyards produced wines prized across the Soviet empire. Today, the wine business still generates 10% of the country's GDP. All these barrels are full with uh, wine. About 30 million liters of wine we have here. Mm -hmm. The Krikova winery boasts the world's second biggest underground wine store. In this old limestone mine, millions of liters are maturing in a network of tunnels 100 kilometers long. Not all the wine here is homegrown. Some of it comes flavored with the most extraordinary history. Krikova's marketing director, Alexander Alexeyev, showed me wine from the personal collection of Hitler's henchman, Hermann Göring, brought here from Berlin in 1945 by the Russian Red Army. Can I touch it? Yeah, you can. So this is a, uh, a Moselle wine from 1935. Yeah. It's a historic and don't 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 do it. Oh, yeah. oh this, sorry. Because uh, sometimes sometimes uh, some of these uh, wines are dead wine and we say that the price is for the dust from this bottle. <laughs> yeah, it's the price is for the history of this bottle. If you were to auction a bottle of Hermann Göring's wine, how much do you think a bottle would fetch? I think it can be 20 or 25,000 euro for one bottle. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. And here there are hundreds of bottles. 129. Oh my God. That's a very valuable collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These days, Russia consumes 30% of all the wine Krikova produces. Well, it did, until Moscow imposed a ban on Moldovan wine in a thinly disguised retaliation for the country's decision to cozy up to the EU. Alexander, you've brought me to uh, store number 275. Why, why is this one significant? Yeah, this is a private collection of the president of the uh, Russia, the Russian Federation, Mr. Putin. Ah, how many bottles has he got? He has uh, 600 bottles. Now, I find it very interesting that you store wine for Vladimir Putin. It's a gift to Vladimir Putin. Yeah, it's a gift of our government. You've lost a massive market, haven't you? Just how damaging has the Russian ban on your wine been for you? It uh, damaged uh, our export in short period of time 
but it is a, like a cold shower. Uh, now we uh, try to find new markets. Um, uh, we try to find new markets in European Union. Uh, we uh, sign an important contract in uh, China. Uh, we promote our wines in the United States and we try to find new markets, new way to promote our wines. Do you think, in all honesty, that Moldova can compete and win in Europe? Well, absolutely. I know that we can and we will do this. I think in two, three years you will have about Moldova. Uh, you, you, will, you, it, you will have possibility to find Moldovan wines in the good restaurants in all Europe. Moldova has always been a frontier land, culturally and linguistically connected to Romania to the west, but drawn into Russia's orbit from the time of the Tsars. The regional landscape is now deeply unstable. Ukraine, Moldova's eastward neighbor, is convulsed with violence. Russia appears more determined than ever to project its power in its own backyard. When the Soviet Union disintegrated 24 years ago, a fault line was exposed inside Moldova. While most of the country backed independent statehood, inhabitants of a sliver of territory on the east bank of the Nistria River broke away. The rebels were Russians, Ukrainians and Russian-speaking Moldovans. In 1992, there was a brief bloody war, which saw the Transnistrian separatists take on the Moldovan army. Over 2,000 people, soldiers and civilians, lost their lives. The fighting ended when Russian forces entered Transnistria. They were billed as peacekeepers, in fact, they were guarantors of Transnistria's separation from Moldova. Some of today's separatist fighters in eastern Ukraine had their first taste of battle in Transnistria. Today, checkpoints and guards signal the de facto border between Moldova and Transnistria. This frontier isn't on any international map. And even though we'd been granted rare official access, it still took us an hour to pass through. Nothing on this front line is taken on trust. Away from the main road, the tension is less evident. But the sense remains of Transnistria being a territory fueled by suspicion of the outside world. So this is Europe's forgotten front line. Behind me is Moldova. Here is the breakaway territory of Transnistria. Now this no man's land isn't exactly heavily fortified. In fact, two of the five Transnistrian border guards who are posted right here are currently taking a nap. But they aren't the real deterrent here. The real deterrent is Russia. Russian and Soviet influence looms large over Tiraspol, the capital of the self-proclaimed Republic of Transnistria. The political heroes, the architectural style, the very visible military presence, all smack of a mindset forged back in the USSR. Transnistria keeps the size of its own armed forces a closely guarded secret. We were allowed to film these self-styled special forces but their training was cut short when it started raining. These men know that if push comes to shove, they can count on the support of 2,000 well-armed Russian soldiers permanently based on Transnistrian soil. 
The military memorials here tell their own story of mutual commitment. Plenty of Transnistrian blood has already been spilled for the Russian motherland. Just half a million people live in this statelet. Я хочу поменять 100 евро, пожалуйста. But they have all the trappings of sovereignty, including their own currency. Спасибо. A fistful of Transnistrian rubles might look impressive, but outside this tiny territory, they're absolutely worthless. Transnistria boasts a collection of heavy industrial enterprises. A steel plant and factories built by the Soviet planners. The territory's economy is kept running by free gas supplied by Russia's Gazprom and huge annual subsidies from Moscow. Without them, Transnistria's government would be broke. It's a territory dominated by the elderly. Many young adults leave to find work. Most go to Russia, but increasing numbers are taking up the offer of Moldovan passports, which gives them access to the EU. I wondered if that might be diluting Transnistria's passionate pro-Russian sentiment. The answer from these people was emphatic. Do you see your future more in Europe or with Moscow, with Russia? Would you really rather be a part of Russia? I mean, is Vladimir Putin the leader that you would like to be responsible for you? Я пенсионер, я пенсионер, и даже не меняла паспорт. У меня остался паспорт, который внутренний, как Советского Союза. Я гражданин Советского Союза. Все у нас все есть, от души все у нас есть. Вот чтобы только дали нас спокойно жить, никто нас не трогал бы. Мы всем довольны. Transnistria's leader, Yevgeny Shevchuk, wants his territory to be incorporated into the Russian Federation. Where Crimea has gone, he would like to follow. History, language, culture and politics, he says, make it inevitable. And to illustrate the point, he took me to the disputed town of Bender on the banks of the Nistria River, to an Orthodox church built by the Russian Tsars and restored by Transnistria's defiant breakaway government. Mr. President, do you feel here that your land is Russian? И очень важно, очень важно, чтобы вы заметили, что Приднестровцы духовно едины с Россией, потому что основная религия православная и традиция единая, и это очень важно для наших. The Moldovan Prime Minister says he would be happy to guarantee the security of places like this. You could come and worship, you could uh, be free to do whatever you want to do. Just accept Moldovan sovereignty. Why not? Что касается предложения премьера, высказанное там о том, что они гарантируют безопасность и так далее, хочу сказать, что это нужно демонстрировать не на базе военной силы, а на базе доброго отношения к Приднестровцам. А когда блокируют экономику, создают условия для того, чтобы деградировала жизнь, нельзя назвать это добрым отношением. Политика принуждения, я думаю, что она не даст результатов. The Nistria River runs like a raw wound through Moldova, symbolizing the failure of efforts to create a unified nation. Transnistria has no international legal standing, but it will be kept afloat as long as Russia sees it as a useful asset in its strategic standoff with the West. As the American team, as part of the um, OSCE 
As a result of rising tensions between Russia and the West, stoked by the Ukraine crisis, Moldova is no longer Europe's forgotten corner. In Chisinau, I came across a delegation from the US Congress trying to reassure Moldovans that America cares about their future security. Senator Benjamin Cardin, let me ask you this. How vulnerable do you feel Moldova to be right now? Well, Moldova is in a critical position and they're making the decisions for their future. I think they have no choice. They understand their economic future is with Europe. The association agreement was ratified in record time. Clearly, there'll be uh, issues with Russia. Russia will try to do everything they can to keep Moldova uh, out of uh, Europe. But I think it's inevitable that Moldova understands this and they're on that path and it's good for their future. From Chisinau's international airport, Moldovans can now fly visa-free into most of the European Union. Hundreds of thousands now make their living abroad. And EU companies like the low-cost airline Wizz Air are tapping into Moldova's more open economy. Slowly, sometimes painfully, the continent's poorest country is being integrated into the European family. Moldova's Prime Minister, Yuri Lanka, has staked his career on delivering Moldova's European destiny. But the path is littered with obstacles, highlighted by the crisis in neighbouring Ukraine. Prime Minister Yuri Lanka, welcome to Hard Talk. Has the crisis and the violence in Ukraine uh, brought a real sense of vulnerability, insecurity here in Moldova. Well, the tragic developments in Ukraine, which is just in our neighborhood, of course, um, are very dangerous for Ukraine, but they are very dangerous for the region and for the continent. Not just because uh, by these uh, violent actions uh, we see the entire very still fragile security architecture, uh, which was in the process of being built, is now basically destroyed and we need to launch the process again. But because it does raise um, a lot of concerns, concerns in terms of security, concerns in terms of our economic uh, situation, because we, especially in Moldova, a very small country and very dependent and vulnerable on the regional shocks and on the regional problems. So you, but you, what is you even feel worse, vulnerable today. You what sound is even, as though what you is feel even worse? Uh, it brings and it has brought and it still brings the uncertainty. And there is nothing worse than uncertainty because you don't know what might happen today, what might happen tomorrow, and what shall be your answers to those possible scenarios, both positive or also even so negative. You talk of uncertainty, surely what has become more clear, more certain, is that Russia has the ability and certainly the intention to impose its influence and ultimately, you could argue, its authority on its neighborhood, what they call the near abroad, uh, the old Soviet empire, if you like, and you stand as a part of that near abroad? Well, uh, we are not direct neighbors with Russia, but Russia to us is an important country for many, many You're reasons. You're a former part of the Soviet uh, Union. Yes, we used to be a part of the empire. And we uh, know that Putin says the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he wants to reassert Russian and Moscow's authority over what used to be the Soviet empire. Uh, what we have to understand that there are new realities, and the realities of the new world is that Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia, are subjects of the international law and equal subjects. And that if you want to have a predictable and civilized relationship in this part of the world and on, based on it to build a stable, predictable and also a prosperous um, uh, region, 
we need to respect each other's opinions. We need to recognize, and by the way, we always acknowledge and we do acknowledge Russia's legitimate interests. The only problem is how you pursue those interests. Does Russia have legitimate interests in Moldova? Well, Russia has legitimate interests, EU has legitimate interests, US have legitimate Chinese as well, big countries. Uh, uh, and uh, if you ask me why, I'll be happy to explain. But again, the only problem is how you pursue those interests. You can project your soft power, uh, your uh, attractiveness, and that's what basically EU does, that's what EU does, and that's what Russia should do in order to get this influence and to have a, a role in the developments. You say, look, we have to take responsibility for ourselves. There are many things we must work on. The truth is, when it comes to energy, you are totally reliant upon Gazprom. We don't get it for uh, free of charge. We pay an exorbitant price for this gas. Uh, and uh, it's, our, it's their interest to sell it to us and it, their interest us to be able to pay it for it. Again, we pay a lot. Uh, but uh, that's why we are focused very much on creating an alternative source of supply. On the 27th of August, when we will celebrate the 24th anniversary of our independence, we will put in place the gas pipeline across Port River, across the border with Romania. And on that specific day, we will be import the first volumes of gas from Romania. In two years, we will have a fully functioning alternative uh, supply channel, both in terms of energy, electricity, also in terms of gas. So it's a process, but again, it's a very interdependent but your, your, your message to me constantly is you will not be bullied by Vladimir Putin. No, it's not about being bullied. I just to say that for, as the old native language says, for a tango you need two. We are very much eager and interested to dance in a nice harmonious way according to certain rules. It's up to our colleagues in Moscow to decide what kind of dance they want to have with us. I dare say you have thought about this, but I just wonder whether you feel that you've missed a window of opportunity in Europe. Because if you see the last European election results, you see that uh, an extraordinary performance by nationalistic, some would say sometimes xenophobic political parties in Western Europe who are uh, anti-immigrant, they are worried about open borders, and frankly, they're very worried about extending the EU to countries like Moldova. And it may be that the political temperature in much of the European Union has moved against Moldova. I still believe that the window of opportunity is, is, is there. And what makes me happy is that despite these new feelings in Europe, everyone understands that even bringing the small Moldova is, uh, would be an objective in much bigger than the uh, territory and the population of Moldova, because it would mean that we are able to spread the air of stability and security further to southeastern Europe, and not just to well, allow this instability to be, be, to be driven into the EU. It is not the likely outcome for Moldova that you will be stuck in a sort of twilight zone. You will be the subject of a, of a perpetual tug of war between Moscow and the European Union, and then the net result will be that you will not be able to achieve the aspirations that you've set out with me. I'm quite optimistic that yes, we will be able to get the European perspective to become candidate and then to become, I don't know, it's not that important, but it's five or seven or eight years. What is critical for me is to win the elections, to continue this path, and to become candidate. Then we will be move, put on the irreversibility side of our pro-democratic, pro-reform um, uh, movement. And in a word, you will not let Vladimir Putin stop you. It, we need just to convince our citizens that our uh, path uh, is the only one without alternative for Moldova. And I'm sure that we can do it. Together with the support from uh, European uh, friends and partners, we will get there, I'm sure. It's not so hard to imagine Moldova's future inside the EU. The culture is Latin, the language too. On a summer evening in Chisinau, there's an unmistakably European vibe. But Transnistria is just an hour's drive from here. Russia remains determined to shape the future of its former empire. Chisinau is currently calm, but it may not last.